morning, NSFers. I hope you are able to hear us now. I can see quite a few of you have joined. With us today, Dr. Jim Wilson. Many of you remember him from our last presentation. So as NSF goes live due to COVID, we thought it was appropriate that we return to the COVID theme. Um, we're also very honored to have quite a, um, a esteemed panel with us. So Mike Matthews, many of you remember, Mike gave our presentation in uh, January when the election seemed like the most important thing we were gonna have to deal with in 2020. Um, Mike is a protective security agent for the Department of Homeland Security. And so he's gonna give a, a DHS perspective, Chris Lake. Great. So Chris is the executive director of the Nevada Health Association. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Maureen, and, and thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's on this uh, webinar. I'm gonna take about the next five minutes and, and kind of go through what we do at the Nevada Hospital Association in regards to COVID and how we use the uh, medical intelligence to monitor our healthcare system capacities and, uh, and capabilities. So uh, the, the, the foundation of, of this system is daily healthcare system monitoring. Every single day, a, our, our licensed hospitals throughout the state of Nevada, including acute care, as well as uh, tier two and three hospitals, which would be like rehab hospitals and LTAC hospitals, they're sent a survey that, that has approximately uh, 30 questions on it. Um, some are specific to their current hospital census and, and others are specific to various equipment types, how many COVID patients they have in each facility, how long they've been there when they were diagnosed, um, how many deaths, things of that nature. And then we use this information, we produce uh, graphs and trend lines that uh, the governor and the National Guard and everybody else can, can see to, to monitor where we are currently as a state and by region, and also to identify if there's any individual hospitals that are reaching capacity or need a push of supplies or push of ventilators, things of that nature. Um, and when you see or you, uh, you hear on the radio, the TV, the news, or from one of the county health departments, uh, hospital occupancy rates, or uh, you might hear, you know, 74% of the ICU beds are occupied. All that information is coming from our system. That's all feeding uh, their live streams and their, and their pools. So the, the key that we found is we need to, to understand our overall supply and demand in healthcare, and particularly, particularly at the hospital level, because it's not just about the COVID patient, although the COVID patient is very important for the spread of disease and to monitor those type of things, um, in, in the hospitals it's about how do we monitor our capabilities and capacity to treat everybody. Because it's, even though we, we have the, the COVID is the, the, the big scary uh, disease that's out there, there's still people having heart attacks, strokes, all those type of things. And we need to make sure we have the overall capacity in ventilators and ICU capability and in, in hospital beds that we can treat the overall medical needs of, of everybody in the state of Nevada. And so we, we started uh, looking at percentages of critical infrastructure that was used within the healthcare, uh, the healthcare systems. And you can see that uh, on here, we're, we're actually at about 63% occupancy, and we've been pretty flat and level at uh, a range of a, between 60 and 68%. Uh, and, and ICU capacity is about 74%, which is relatively normal for us. And our ventilator capacity is down into the 30s. Um, so we haven't seen that big spike or that demand that uh, that New York or other states saw. And uh, I think Jim will go into it, but when we did the social distancing as fast as we did and as, as aggressively as we did, we really flattened that curve. So it, when you look at the models, um, most of that peak was supposed to happen around uh, the 9th of April. And because we flattened that curve, we never saw the critical infrastructure of the healthcare system um, suffer a, a big impact where we got overrun 
or where we couldn't provide the care that we need to for, for all of our residents. We also monitor uh, equipment types. So on this slide, and I cut out the, uh, the specifics on which hospital, and it's just a little snapshot. But you can see we, we capture, based on the, the type of hospital and the, uh, and the tier that they're in, uh, as well as the numbers of very specific items like eye protection, gloves, N95 mask, et cetera, going down there. These are considered the PPE that's critical for our, our hospitals. And then we ask each of their supply people to rate it as a, on, a, on a stoplight kind of rating system as a green, yellow, or red. And what we found is, is that's pretty subjective. There's a lot of people, excuse me, a lot of people that seem to hit things as yellow instead of green, mostly because the supply chain is unpredictable. They don't know if they're gonna get their full orders. They don't know if they're gonna get half the order or if they're gonna be on an allocation next week, those kind of things. So if they're having some unpredictability in their supply chain, they'll, they'll hit it as yellow. Or if they were denied an order um, from their supplier, they might hit it as red. But you'll notice that uh, a lot of the, the red are in coveralls and uh, PAPR, um, those are respirators, but uh, some of the disposable supplies that go along with them are getting, uh, getting difficult to, to get. And then on the, uh, the far right, that actually is body bags. That's not a PPE item, but it was an item that for a long time was in critical short supply. So, so we monitor all of this on a daily basis and feed this information to the National Guard. So when they distribute items from the, uh, the stockpiles that we have, they're targeting specific hospitals and specific locations that truly need the equipment or the supplies instead of doing the mass distributions where hospitals are getting more than they, they, they may actually need and other people might be getting shorted. And I would say the, the, the other key to this is it is all voluntary. All of our hospitals in the state are contributing this information every single day on a voluntary basis. There was never an order uh, by the governor to share this information. There was never a, an order by the president to share this information. The hospital community just jumped up and said, this is what we need to do so that we can all have an operating understanding of where we are, where the patients are, where the demands are, and the, the peaks and where the surplus is. And so we can balance patient load and we can continue to, to treat, you know, all hazards or, or all causes that require hospitalization. It was one of the lessons that we learned from the, uh, the shooting on, a, you know, the Harvest Festival shooting was that having system status uh, idea of the entire healthcare system allows us to balance uh, patients back and forth and keep any one hospital from being overloaded. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Jim and he can talk about how he uses this information and how we, uh, we gather the intelligence that uh, we share also with all of our hospitals. Okay, so what we're gonna get into now is kind of how did we make the sausage, so to speak. And this is the timeline of uh, detection and warning. So really what you're witnessing here is, a, is what we believe is a historical first in our, in our country, is that we basically directly plugged uh, intelligence in at the local level. Um, <clears throat> in my past life, when um, you know we were looking at the warning failure of West Nile in 1999, and then we looked at the warning failure of SARS, and uh, and I was involved in providing warning on swine flu, we always routed the information through uh, CDC as a priority. Um, what we found during those engagements is there was an inordinate time delay going on at the federal level to verify the information when really the, our frontline responders were the ones at risk to, uh, in our communities to take the hit. And we saw that with uh, the New York City outbreak with swine flu in 2009. So after 25 years of seeing this over and over and over again, we just, you know, basically I, I made the decision that we're going to just plug this straight into our state and CDC can play catch up later, but we're gonna get moving on this now. So on December 30th, 31st, uh, we intercepted Ozen, as we discussed in the prior briefing of an unusual outbreak in Wuhan. Um, 
On December 31st, we did an air traffic analysis to understand what U.S. cities are connected to Wuhan by direct nonstop air traffic. Uh, San Francisco was highlighted at that point in time. Um, we issued a public notification to WHO on January 1st. We indicated that the virus was not SARS, but something possibly new. Um, then we also publicly posted on LinkedIn, uh, tagged California as a, as a state that was at high risk of receiving cases. We, we're now finding out that, that their first fatality of COVID was actually in February 6th in Santa Clara County. Um, <clears throat> notification to our Nevada medical infrastructure, we issued 15 reports up to today. Uh, today's report will be the 16th uh, report. Um, from January 20th, uh, you know, after January 5th onward. Um, highlighted in red there is, is us basically translating the indicators that we were tracking worldwide into application to our state monitoring system and what, what we really needed to pay attention to. Um, up to that point, however, you know, Chris and I had discussed, you know, from January and February, we discussed what we were looking at in Italy and Singapore and other countries. So basically what we were doing is digesting all this information across the planet that was getting inundated with coronavirus and, and picking out what are those critical infrastructure indicators that we really got to monitor here stateside. Um, March 4th was the first case in Nevada. March 15th, first death report in Nevada. Uh, March 26th was the first acute care infrastructure report uh, by Chris um, through the NHA. So this was a fantastic partnership. We've been at it for 116 days straight now. That represents about 600 hours worth of work to do that. This is the perspective of COVID. On the right, all the way over on the right, it's about 900 fatalities per 100,000 population documented in the city of Philadelphia in the first uh, wave of the 1918 influenza pandemic. So we still see people getting on the media and talking about 1918. The bottom line here is we are nowhere near close to 1918 in terms of, of impact yet. And I think the perspective there is, if I were to say that to ICU nurses working in New York City, they're gonna take me out in the parking lot and beat me up because from their perspective, this is a catastrophe. They don't care about 1918, they care about what's happening right now. I think from a national security perspective, you know, sort of a, a you know, standoff position, look at this and, and say, okay, historically, where does this fall in all of the threats that we've managed to absorb as a country? It is clear, still clear, and this is no change from my briefing on the 12th of March, um, that this is a lesser threat. Okay, but look at how much damage this lesser threat has done. And so that carries strong implications for, you know, a complete re-envisioning of what do we call, you know, a national security threat. And, and how, do we, how do we assess our vulnerabilities to that threat? I think it's, if I were to say, what are the issues that we had a hard time assessing up front, is the degree to which social media and, and just our, our supply chain vulnerabilities and, and all the distrust we have politically, uh, you know, inside our own country with China, et cetera, et cetera, that there's so much um, vulnerability encapsulated in that side of it that even a lesser threat can have dramatic impact, right? And so that's something for us to unpack academically later. But the point of this slide is to highlight where we're at. So the US national uh, fatalities per 100,000 population due to the coronavirus right now stands at 15. Um, our current influenza season capped out at 13. I will say that the reporting on influenza abruptly truncated over the last uh, month or so because of coronavirus. So everybody got, is now distracted with coronavirus. So we're not really reporting influenza. I will tell you here in Nevada, we are still seeing influenza positive showing up clinically. So it's just a, it's a bias in the data. Um, something we'll have to unpack later. But you'll notice that New, New Orleans, um, they're hitting pretty high fatalities, right? So uh, New York City as well. And these were areas of the country that really aren't, it's not surprising to see this level of mortality. These are uh, cities that have older, uh, you know, an older community. There might be uh, some genetics involved in there, a vulnerability, particularly among the African-American uh, communities. A lot of comorbidities um, and, and just poor infrastructure in these places. Uh, New York City was not prepared. They weren't really prepped up and ready to go. 
uh, to receive a Lombardia level of, um, of fatality. Um, this is where we stand uh, in relation to other countries in terms of our, of our uh, fatalities per 100,000 population. You've seen a lot of media talk of Sweden and their innovative, you know, their controversial innovative uh, social distancing policy, which is sort of laissez-faire. Um, there's a price to that. They are seeing higher fatalities. The, the academic debate is, you know, are you just gonna take the fatality all at once and just get it over with and then be left with herd immunity or uh, flatten the curve and drag it out for months or years? Um, I think the, the debate that everyone is struggling with is can any nation's economy stand to be in lockdown status for that long a period of time without doing unbelievable damage to our um, national welfare from an economic standpoint? It's an ethical debate, right? You know, it's, it basically comes down to what's the value of the human lives involved. This is straight from CDC. Um, on the right there, just as we noted in the briefing in March 12th, uh, with the reports from other countries, that this is predominantly a disease of the elderly uh, and folks with comorbidities, uh, like hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Um, the cumulative hospitalization so far per 100,000 population, that graph on the left there, that places coronavirus as of April, the, the week ending April 11th, places that in context with all the other seasons of influenza that we've seen since uh, 2009. And so that, again, you should kind of sit back, you know, those of us here focused on national security, we really should sit back and say, wow, wow, look at the impact here and yet place that in context with the socioeconomic disruption it has caused. So coming back to Nevada now, um, what we're able to do is, is because we had issued reports and, and really analyzed what was going on in countries that preceded our nation in terms of contact with this threat, we're now able to very quickly uh, understand and compare the impact of, the, uh, of this threat on our infrastructure in the state in relation to other states. So here I'm focusing on the Western region. So this is California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, in Idaho. Um, and so, you know, we have data for some of the states and not data for other states. So Idaho isn't really reporting a lot of data. Um, unfortunately for them, may, it's possible they might be, you know, might consider that data, you know, confidential and don't want to share it. Um, we've encouraged people to share this data because if you have a state that precedes other states, you know, you can save lives in other states based on what you're going through. But basically, Nevada is leading um, the region right now um, in a couple of parameters. So, um, you know, it's not real clear why that is. Um, it might be because we have differences in our age group, our infrastructure, our comorbidity status. We haven't quite managed to peel apart the the reasons why, but this is the data as it stands. In terms of mortality though, um, we're actually doing better uh, than Washington. So Washington got hit pretty hard, as you recall. Um, <clears throat> this is at the state level. This is the, the actual um, medical intelligence report for this morning, um, talking about the state level infrastructure impacts here. And what we're doing is, is as Chris explained, are, um, we have flattened the curve. The infrastructure is managing things quite well. In fact, the infrastructure indices are so low that we're a little worried about our healthcare system having enough revenue from, from basic patient flow to keep their doors open. So the irony here is we're seeing healthcare facilities around the country um, going bankrupt and, and putting workers on furlough because they can't see patients and make money to pay their personnel. And so, you know, the, the struggle we have here is, is we've got to strike a balance of, you know, keeping the revenue flowing and keeping our response infrastructure open and flexible and able to manage the, uh, the surge. So that's the challenge here. So <clears throat> again, if we wouldn't even have had this system in place to begin with if we didn't have all the intelligence process from all these foreign countries that got hit before us. So again, this is, um, to our knowledge, this is a first um, in the U.S. here. Um, and this is, this is really, this has been a real labor of love uh, for Chris and, and certainly all the hospitals involved. I mean, this takes a lot of effort to input data 
and have it accessible and, and analyzable like this. We do do uh, statistical we um, do statistical analyses on these trends to see if we have any statistically significant trend changes. So the red line on the upper right there, the occupied ventilators, that's a statistically significant trend, a decrease in trend. So on the left here is a breakdown of the data. So we actually can kick this data very quickly down to the hospital level. We can kick it down to the regional level. So on the left there, those are the parameters for the north. And on the right, these are the parameters for the south. So this is the Southern Nevada Health District area. Um, <clears throat> And then this last slide here, this is the, the model that uh, the White House has been using and referring to. This is the IHME, University of Washington um, uh, model. This is Chris Murray's group funded by um, Bill Gates. Um, and really, you know, I've, we've had, well, I have had a lot of experience um, operationally dealing with models. And you can get burned if you, if you don't put this data in perspective and kind of take all of this with a grain of salt. And it's, it's really tricky de dealing with this. It's not that you don't, that you distrust the modelers. The issue is if you use data from China to run these models, you may find that your models are not accurate or, or giving you projections that are a bit over the top compared to, you know, if you had used a different country with more credible data or a better infrastructure to support credible reporting of data. But the bottom line here in our read of this figure is bottom line, this could have been a lot worse. This could have been um, a lot more painful for our state population and we've managed to flatten the curve. And we've done very well with our fatalities there as a result. So it's really important to keep in mind that if your medical infrastructure gets overwhelmed and your ICUs are capped out and you've used up all your ventilators and your healthcare staff are getting infected and people are stressed out in, in terms of uh, patient care, what you notice is that the mortality rates look a lot worse, right? So that's what's going on in New York City is that they got capped out and we noticed that their mortality was dramatically higher than other places of the world. And part of that's because their infrastructure was overwhelmed, right? And so that we saw the same thing in Lombardia, we've seen it in Spain. Um, if you wanna compare that to say another country that managed to stay on top of things despite surges in patient flow, uh, you can look at Singapore where they've only had 12 fatalities since this whole thing started. So I'll go ahead and stop right there and we'll see if there's, uh, you know, and, and turn it over to the next speaker and we'll follow up with Q&A uh, later. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. So um, to everybody who's online as an attendee, um, please put your Q&A questions in the Q&A box. Um, and um, or the chat box. Um, we will answer questions at the end, but we'll also, if there are easy answers, we'll try and give those to you as we go along. Um, we are very glad that Caleb joined us. He's on mute right now, because I think he's on the phone with, his, with the, the governor's office. So um, he's going to give an update after Mike. So Mike, I'm gonna let you um, turn it over to you now. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be back with the National Security Forum. I'm very honored and humbled to be in the same group as Dr. Wilson and uh, Dr. Lake and, and Mr. Cage and, and Dr. McCarthy and everyone. So thanks again for having me. I've got to apologize. I went a little heavy on the armor all this morning. So uh, if it's a too much glare, I'm sorry. You'll have to adjust your uh, contrast settings. <clears throat> I want to talk real fast and real quick about what DHS and CIS is doing, particularly what we're doing for the state. What me and my partner down in Las Vegas are supporting with uh, uh, supporting uh, the Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security and all of the counties. <clears throat> so we're trying to be a really good information conduit between the federal agencies and a lot of the stuff we're seeing out there down to the state, as well as making sure that their issues and their concerns that we're hearing, they get elevated to executive levels. So we're making sure we're pushing that back and forth, working in partnership with FEMA and a lot of our other uh, federal partners like CDC and HSS, um, and really trying to lean forward. We're trying to be good risk advisors where we develop um, guidance material. Well, we just released one yesterday about uh, how to keep your operation centers clean. And, and uh, um, <clears throat> while it's focused on critical infrastructure, it's still applicable to a lot of other areas. So we're pushing these things out, making sure that people can continue their operations. Um, the other thing we're focused on is alerting uh, both the executive federal level as well as the state level and county levels uh, of issues and items we're seeing in our five focuses. And this is where I move, this is kind of gets to the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk about. 
CISA, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, is focused on five big things right now. And two of them are like, like eggshells for like an Easter egg. And when we open it up, you have your little jelly beans on the inside. So the first top of that shell is uh, our commodity concerns. We're trying to pay attention to the supply stream, um, cascading impacts. We're looking for deficiencies inside of that supply chain. We're looking for gaps um, and, and things that, 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 are, that are happening so we can get in front of that. And so when we take off that top shell, we start looking at what's really inside of, that, of, of the commodity concerns and that bottom piece that I'll get to in a second. Uh, the first thing is the worker shortage concerns. We're really trying to uh, lean forward and, and talk to our critical infrastructure partners and ask them, how long can you keep up this operations tempo? Back in the very beginning of March, when, when this first started uh, <clears throat> going sideways and we started doing a lot of lockdowns and, and, and sheltering in places across the nation, we all leaned out to our infrastructure partners and our private sector partners and we asked them, how long can you work in a telework environment or a remote delivery type of uh, operation? Can you sustain this for 30 or 60 or 90 or even 180 days? What about your suppliers? What about your raw material providers that is essential to your business operation, whether it's making widgets or it's making potable water for the Reno Sparks area or the Las Vegas area, et cetera? Can they sustain their operation so you can sustain yours? And then we did that, we asked them the same question. What happens if a third of your workforce is sick? What happens if you lose half of your workforce temporarily because they're sick or they're at home taking care of their, their loved ones? Can you continue operations? And if so, how long? So we started leaning forward and trying to, try to plant those seeds or, uh, in, their, in their discussions so they could start getting in front of these things. And we've, seen, we've been very successful in the battle where we've had very minimal impacts with our critical infrastructure. The other thing we're focused on is the increase in demand. We're looking at commodity buying and price points and those types of things. And a great example of this would be the toilet paper run, right? Right as soon as this started, everyone made a run on toilet paper. It's not because the Charmin factory burned down. It's not because Charmin cut their price by, you know, 80%. We're now looking at 20 cent rolls. It's systemic to something else. It's, it's a signal that we need to pay attention to that's telling us something else is going on. So we're, we're, we're watching the increase in demand, whether it's toilet paper, or it's a meat product, or it's a chemical of some sort, and we're trying to diagnose what is the cause of that so we can get in front of it. We're also trying to pay attention to cascading impacts. Now, this is really important because the Protective Security Advisor Program has been around for 15 years, and every time we go to a, um, we call it a client, but every time we go to a client site or, or a critical infrastructure provider, and we sit down and talk to them about physical security or cybersecurity or active shooters or anything like that, we talk to them about business continuity and continuity of operations. And we talk to them about where they get their supply chain and what raw materials do they have to have to be successful and to continue their operation. And where does it come from? How does it get there? And we ask them the same question of their product. Where does their product go? Who relies on their product? How does it get there? What happens if you can't deliver? Or what happens if you can't receive that raw material? And so over 15 years, we've been mapping out these interdependencies and systems. So when we see an increase in demand, we can instantly attribute it to all these other things in there. Conversely, the last jelly bean in this little egg is the decrease in demand. And a great example of that is our gas. All of us are at home right now, and we're using very little gasoline or diesel or, or lube oil or anything like that, which means an upstream impact is the refineries don't have to produce as much because the gas stations don't have to be refilled. If the refineries aren't producing as much, well, it's great on our wallet. There's downstream impacts to that that are not associated with that pipeline we're seeing a decrease in production of carbon dioxide or CO2. That's used in the pork industry and meatpacking industry. It's also used in the water and wastewater industry to sterilize uh, water and treat water. So when we start seeing declines in these areas or, or decrease in demand, we're looking at the interdependencies. Another great example, which could have uh, adverse effects, all the departments of transportation and the public works departments, they're out there doing all these road repairs and street repairs because there's no one on the road. It's a great time to do it. They're getting a lot of work done. They require asphalt. Asphalt is a byproduct of the refining process. If the refineries are slowing down or shutting down, that means there is a decrease of availability of asphalt, which means it could be an increase in prices because of supply and demand, basic economics, and that type of thing. So these are these, these demand signals we're watching and monitoring so we can look at the interdependencies and find those unintended consequences before they actually happen so we can inform executive leadership and they can make those right decisions ahead of time.
So those are those three jelly beans inside this egg. The bottom part of the egg that overarches everything is we're really paying attention to emerging issues. And we're watching how they impact or how they could impact long-term recovery. And I'm gonna leave that for uh, uh, Mr. Page to talk about in detail, but we're really paying attention to those things that are just now starting to break, those breaking news things, or those market trends, or those supply and demands, whether it's an increase in demand or decrease in demand, how does it impact long-term recovery? How does it impact our supply chain? And is there anything we need to make adjustments for right now at a federal level and a state level that could, that could head that off or avoid the, getting caught flat-footed? I'm very grateful to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to a lot of great uh, presentations and the uh, question and question. Thanks a lot, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, unfortunately, the phone call that Caleb got while he was on was the governor's office. So um, he just got pulled into a meeting with the governor. He is going to try and rejoin us, but I think we will move to Q&A now. Um, so, uh, Mike, we may ask you to backfill on the FEMA questions if you can cover some of that. Great. So we have gotten several questions in. We're doing multimedia coordination on questions here. So they're coming in on email and text and chat. Um, so I'm going to try and cover some of the questions were answered um, uh, uh, privately online, but we also have, um, uh, uh, but I'm going to voice them openly so that everybody hears them. Um, one of the key questions, um, and I think this bounces to you, Jim, is the issue of case counts. Um, we have heard um, stories that the case counts aren't reliable. Um, we, are, we actually was reported this week that um, two people died in California in early February, early to mid-February. Um, so clearly they were um, in a pool of cases. So, um, and then, so that's the, potentially we may be underestimating the case counts because there were far more out there before than we realized and or than the testing was catching. Um, and then the, on the flip side, um, how do the case counts really, um, with the comorbidity issues, how do you really differentiate it, whether somebody dies of a heart attack but may have had COVID and, and the cause was a heart attack rather than the COVID? How do you sort out that comorbidity um, case count as well? So that may add to uh, overestimating the cases. So can you give us a little bit more insight on um, how reliable the current state of cases, case counts are in the those, United those States? Those are good questions. So, so the first step is um, recognizing that China did not even understand their own influenza surveillance data had no idea what their true influenza burden was seasonally to begin with when all this began. And when you're dealing with a country like that, and we talked about this on March 12th, what, what leads the detection or leads the recognition of a problem is high severity illness or mortality. And when that happens, then your entire surveillance process worldwide is in reactive mode. And you're basically looking for high severity illness and deaths and it biases the data from the get-go. So what happened in our country is, yeah, we, we were late to the punch with our testing process, um, and we were recognizing you know, clusters of deaths, and, and it's, it's just a classic pattern we see with newly uh, recognized pathogens where we're biased to report the more severe illness and the deaths, and then later, as we unpack what's just happened, we realized, oh, wait a minute, this was far more widespread than we thought, and, and then that decreases the fatality rate as the academic studies are done over time. So it's a classic pattern. Um, the problem though that we have here with respiratory viruses in general is we need to keep in mind that even with seasonal influenza in the United States, we've still been arguing about the true influenza burden in the US for decades. This has been going on since 1918 as we still haven't pinned down accurate statistics for good old fashioned flu. Right, so when we're, when we're dealing with that mess, and then all of a sudden everyone is expecting uber accurate statistics for COVID, it's, it's a ridiculous you know, proposition because we haven't even been able to get flu pinned down yet, right? And so COVID, the way that that, that disease presents clinically very similar to flu is that the vast majority of illness is mild and you don't even notice it. And there's a huge chunk of asymptomatic cases, very similar to flu in that regard. 
and you can't test everybody because that's an that's a hugely expensive proposition and we don't have enough test capacity to begin with there are questions about testing accuracy etc cetera, etc cetera. regarding the the mortality question this is important is you know determining what actually caused that person to die well, if you've got a 90 year old person coming into the hospital and they were already sort of just barely hanging in there with congestive heart failure and they've had that for 20 years. And oh, by the way, they've got a decent, you know, hit of, of type two diabetes going on as well. You know, it really becomes a debate as to what really killed that patient. Was it COVID or, or this, the lifestyle that they had leading up to that infection? And so, you know, our British colleagues are chuckling and saying that this really is a disease of wealthy nations and, and lazy lifestyles. And, you know, that, that's kind of a harsh comment, but, you know, from them, but to some certain degree, they're, they're correct, is that it's, it's exposing a bad lifestyle, if you can think of it that way. And, and COVID becomes that little pebble that trips <clears throat> off the landslide that winds up in the patient dying. So there's a lot of um, challenge to this. I do think, and this is my concern as an analyst, okay? So I, in your ideal analytic world, you're politically unbiased, right? And, and you see me struggling to, to keep people in line and say, look, let's stop talking about Trump. Let's stop talking about Obama. I, I, I wanna focus on the facts here, right? But it does make it easy for people to, on either side of the political spectrum, fudge these numbers either way or argue the numbers either way to emphasize or de-emphasize impact. And so I'm not gonna pick a side here, but I'm gonna point out that because of the ambiguities in this data, it makes it very easy to politicize this stuff. And then that too is a very common pattern in health security crises is the politicalization of the issue. So long Excellent. answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, Chris, I'm very glad to see you back on video. That's great. Um, um, perhaps you could give us um, some in a little bit more in, input about the state of play with the hospitals. You showed us those charts, and um, I heard this morning as I was driving into my office that um, Governor Newsom is um, about to release rel relax some of the um, restrictions against elective surgeries. I know a lot of people are concerned about when the hospitals may be able to open back up for standard procedures. Um, my uh, husband's in line for a knee replacement, so <laughs> I take it personally. Um, what, how, does the, how does the situation look and what would be the information that would drive the decision to be able to re reopen elective surgeries in Nevada? So the... Uh, the, the governor has, has developed his phased in plan and, and wants to open up the, uh, the healthcare system uh, probably as one of the first, the first areas. What he's, he's kind of challenged us to do, and, and we're meeting with all the uh, chief medical officers of the hospitals and the CEOs uh, over the last couple of days, we're looking at the data to try and come up with what do we feel would be a reasonable time or standard for us opening up the uh, the facilities for all types of uh, patients and procedures? And what would be the alert levels? Um, because we are collecting this data, we have the uh, unique capability of, of developing alert levels that would, that would let people know if they were getting close to a capacity issue or low on a particular PPE or things of that nature. So. Um, we're working on that. We're very close to having that uh, completed, and then we will we'll meet with the governor's office, and, and it, the ultimate decision uh, rests with with him. But the, the hospitals are ready to open up and to to start those processes now. Um, we've proven that we can handle the increased load in the in the COVID cases, and it's not it has not presented at this point a capacity problem for us. Um, but we do recognize, you know, all these decisions are, are difficult political decisions that, that the governor has to make. And um, we want to make sure that, you know, no one industry goes out and says, we're ready, open us up. And then that leads to other political, instead of scientifically or data driven decisions to open up other things that, that destroy our social distancing. So, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
Jim and Mike, <laughs> I'd like to come back to you on a question that pertains to the national security impacts. Um, so you mentioned, um, Jim, in your presentation that um, consider the national security impacts, not just of the um, primary impacts of the pandemic directly on the population, 50,000 uh, Americans dead in, you know, what looks like three or four weeks is a pretty substantial number. Um, but the uh, coupling that with the economic issues and other things, um, could both of you talk to, um, put on your national security hats and, and talk to um, how we do risk mitigation from a national security perspective, uh, both in the situation we're in now, but looking down the road, um, planning for future um, impacts and pandemics like this. So um, who wants to go first? Jim, Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Jim. So uh, <clears throat> I think one of the big things is, um, I, I, would, I would say off the top of my head, I think there's three major things. Um, the first thing is very early on, we were focused on the day to day. We're watching the numbers. We're focused on what we have to do right now to protect ourselves. And it was really important for us to break out of that mold and start looking at one week, two week, four week, six week, you know, six month intervals. And when you, because <clears throat> when we talk about a disaster or, or a crisis, if you get behind in that disaster, you're never caught back up ever. And so you have to start really early on when it's chaotic and it's very difficult to start thinking ahead. And so you can position your chess pieces to get to where you need to be at the right time. And so you really have to play double, um, you have to kind of play, play two games at once. You have to play the immediate game and the double game. And I think we did that early on. I think that's really helped us. So um, that, that, that's one way to uh, mitigate risk. Along those things, we have to start thinking about those seasonal things that, that we're, we're talking about. We have to start thinking about that long-term game. So we, we've already started talking about the wildfires. We've already started talking about economic recovery because we all know that economic strength is, is a part of national security. If we're strong economically, people want to be our friends because we've got a lot of money and power. And that's very important. So we've got to get that back. And I think with, with the outline of, uh, um, of the processes and everyone leaning forward to trying to open up jobs and open up the economy, um, I think we're, we're reducing the risk of saying, well, it's just easier to do other things. Um, the other thing I think we need to, to do is to do, um, how can I put this? Um, to continue our role as a, as a world leader. Um, a lot of people are looking to us to be the innovators, uh, looking to America to be the innovators and the ones who are going to solve this problem, so to speak. And they're watching what we're doing closely. And I think now is the time we start showing people how we can handle these situations as well. Because our adversary is going to be looking at bioterrorism. They're going to be looking at bio strikes or chemical strikes and those types of things. And everyone's watching with national implications about what, how we're responding to this so they can think about their offensive behaviors towards uh, an aggression towards the United States. And I think if we're very open about how aggressively we're treating this and how uh, behind it America is, and I know there's some um, – uh, so a lot of discussions right now about people wanting to go back to work and the protests and stuff. Uh, but I think this, this, will, this will strengthen us in the long run, we're, particularly when we're looking at biosecurity uh, as a national, national security implication. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jim, you uh, want to add to that? So I guess w one of the issues that or threads that I've been sucked into along the way, because I've been, you know, obviously coordinating with our allies as well on this is you know, what um, we had in January and early February an opportunity to exert a substantial amount of diplomacy with China and sort of turn this into a positive story. Um, I still am of the opinion that China did share an awful lot of information up front that back in SARS, uh, they did not. And so what I find is there are a lot of intelligence analysts and who are more generalists and folks who don't work in this specific, you know, rarefied domain, expressing opinions about what China did or didn't do. And there, there's a lot of saber rattling going on that I find disturbing because it's not informed by technical experts in this domain. And, you know, making accusations about lab accidents and what, what China hid and what they didn't hide. And, 
And where that's taking us now is China's got a carrier, uh, you know, fleet out in the Pacific, and our carrier fleet was disabled because of COVID. And we've got a lot of people pointing out that China's taking advantage of this now on the global stage. And I, I question whether this was a smart play to, to, to go after China when we could have turned this into a positive story. We've instead turned it into a very adversarial conversation that, um, you know, I, it's going to be interesting to see, uh, not maybe interesting in a good way, to see how the ripple effect of all this affects our national security in our diplomacy with countries around the world. So um, in terms of how it should affect our national security strategy, I think it was under Clinton that we really began aggressively talking about other topical non-traditional national security areas like environmental security, for instance, and uh, global climate change. We talked about that in the 90s. And um, you know, the, the question there is, um, you know, how do we redefine national security now, seeing all this damage that has occurred? You know, is in where does this fall in the rack and stack of priorities? And how many people have died in this event compared to how many who died in the AFPAC engagement or, or Iraq? You know, and so it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of really sticky questions. Um, if I if I told the audience of what has happened for the last 25 years in our attempts to get a warning system up and running that's sustainable for this nation, the audience would be appalled. And Maureen, you know, you know the beginnings of those stories, right? And, and it's really appalling to see how hard we had to work to protect our country from a material threat that has killed you know, tons of Americans now between all these different health security engagements we've, we've gotten involved in. And yet we still continue to kind of blow this off as though it's not really a national security issue. So I don't know, we have a lot of reckoning to do here in the coming months and years. Excellent, Jim. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to bounce back to um, a combination of Chris and Jim now. Um, and this is um, talking about the impacts um, of a potential second wave or multiple wave um, uh, if the, and obviously COVID will be with us um, for the duration for a while, um, what do you anticipate and what will you be looking for uh, to mitigate the impacts of um, a return to COVID um, rising cases when we go back into the next flu season? Or are you concerned about the next flu season? So this this is Chris. I'll take a, a crack at that one to begin with. Um, we we are definitely concerned uh, with the flu season. If if we ha the the COVID cases that we we saw here in Nevada seemed to come in right after the uh, the flu season had let up. So we had excess capacity in our hospitals um, because all the flu patients had just been discharged, you know, the timing and sequencing uh, seemed to work in our favor on that. But uh, that is one of the reasons we're, we're maintaining our, our, our system of monitoring the hospital capacity and capability for at least the next 12 months. So if we see incremental increases um, in the, the hospital patient, all cause patient load or ventilator utilization, those kind of things, we'll watch that slowly creep up. We're not expecting any big spikes, like all of a sudden one day, there's another 400 patients. Uh, with these pandemics and, and with the flu, they generally creep up. So we're, we're putting in the system in some warning thresholds. So, you know, it's like the frog in the boiling water thing. You know, we might not catch on because it's just one or two a day, but when it hits that warning threshold, you know, the alarm bells go off and we can start implementing our surge plans and we can start doing you know, ventilator rentals from other, other areas and bringing them in to, uh, to meet that need. So we're, mo you know, we're monitoring that. We, we feel like we'll have the capacity uh, within our system based on where we are uh, now to maintain that. Um, but, uh, but we are definitely gonna monitor the system throughout the blue season. Yeah, I think what, what you guys are seeing here is something that hasn't been done before. 
and it takes a ton of work. And I think the missing voice here in this discussion is that poor nurse that has to enter data for her major hospital every day because we've asked her to do it, right? Um, and they're the real heroes here is that they are contributing uh, to a system and it's a very manual process and it's very time consuming. It's incredibly complex data. Um, but we're learning and learning and learning and we're now understanding what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. And it's, it's kind of an exciting time, actually. There's a positive story to this. Um, but I think the challenge for Chris and I going forward is to, to convince these folks to keep maintaining that report flow, maybe at a lower op tempo, maybe it'd be just a once a week kind of report so that we can maintain monitoring as we play around with the social distancing question as well as getting hit with, with flu. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out, right? Excellent. Um, thanks, Jim. Okay, so I'm going to turn back to you, Jim, um, with a couple uh, medical related questions, not un unsurprising. Um, two questions. One is the, um, do you have any more insight on the timeline for the vaccines? And the second related question is the question about antibody testing and would antibody testing really um, indicate immunity and if so can that be used in the um, concept uh, you know as part of the reopening strategy okay so there's a lot to unpack there um, some of the communication patterns that we know are common in any health security crisis is the promise of a pharmaceutical magic pill whether it's an antiviral or a vaccine, that thread of communication pops up with every single one of these emerging pathogens that we've documented over the last 25 years. There's always a company out there, there's always a strategy out there that says, hey, you know, this is a big crisis, we're all gonna die and we need a vaccine. And so there's kind of a tricky little, you know, ethical conundrum that we get stuck in over and over and over again, and that is, to tell the public that you need to treat this seriously and support Congress funding the research and development to have these countermeasures in the first place. That is two thumbs up, I fully support that, right? The Problem is, is that congressional interest in these topics wanes just like that as soon as the crisis is over, you get this boom and bust kind of cycle of interest and, and political interest in these topics and that's what's been killing us this whole time really is this boom and bust sort of behavior. The flip side to that is that when, that when those communications are out in public, then the public is like hanging on this promise of hope of a vaccine that we may or may not be successful in developing. And we need to keep in mind that vaccines, when you develop them, you have to prove that they're safe, you know, that you're not going to hurt people with that vaccine. And we need to keep in mind that leading up to this crisis, we've been battling the anti-vaccination movement like crazy because they kept pointing out you know, erroneous and misleading statistics about the dangers of vaccines, the so-called dangers of vaccines, right? So we got to tread carefully here and make sure that whatever's developed is safe, it is truly effective, and, you know, isn't going to hurt people more than the actual disease itself, right? So I guess my, my bottom line answer on the vaccine is they're projecting 18 months if they can do it. And I tell the average patient family, I just say, look, don't count on it. You know, I think I think where we're at with this is we're kind of hoping that that we're going to have some measure of herd immunity. Now, how long that lasts, I don't think anybody knows. Um, another common thread is to paint a new virus or a new pathogen as though it's like an alien virus that we've never encountered in science before, and it's going to decimate us all. And there's all these uncertainties, and it's going to do weird things that have never been documented before. You know, I, I kind of sit back and say, you know, I've been through this enough times to know that, that okay, yeah, there's uncertainties here, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean this is a virus that is much different than other viruses we're used to dealing with in medicine that are respiratory related. So the example I would give you is a, if, if some of the, the audience may recall during Zika, there was a finding that Zika was transmitted sexually, right? And they did find cases that were transmitted that way. The very next thing that a global health expert did was get on CNN and compare it to the HIV pandemic and ask the question about whether or not Zika was going to become the next HIV pandemic. So it just, <laughs> we're in a perpetual cycle of trust but verify. 
I think the antibody test, if we can come up with a test kit that we believe in, that we understand the, the sensitivity and specificity, the false positives, false negatives associated with that test, and we can trust that test and it's at a good price point, then that is gonna be a valuable tool going forward, if for nothing else, then to protect our healthcare workforce and help tone down the tremendous anxiety and fear that we're still seeing amongst our frontline healthcare responders. Excellent. Um, thank you, Jim. That was a very thorough answer. Um, so I'm going to just throw it out to the three of you right now to just give us, you know, sort of the 30 second snapshot as we close out um, on your thoughts for um, close your eyes, imagine us now, um, you know, six months from now. Um, what are we, what can we do right? <laughs> What do we want to avoid doing wrong? Um, what are the things that we really need to be thinking of? We're very caught up in the crisis right now on April 24th, but let's fast forward to Christmas Eve. And um, what do you think in the, in the best picture for Nevada, what will we have done right to be able to, you know, be celebrating the holidays come December? Or will we? One of the things we can do wrong is the same thing we can do wrong with, with the election cycle. The same thing I talked about then is trust social media and not trust the actual sources and not, not do our own research and stuff. Going to CDC and going to CISA.gov and going to FEMA's rumor page on coronavirus and, and those types of things and trusting experts like Dr. Wilson and Dr. Lake um, and, and, and the ones who are supplying our executive leadership with the information, that's when we rely on social media, we relied on, on Bob down the street, and no offense to Bob, but we're relying on Bob down the street, who, who's a mechanic, who's, who, who's got his information from another social media guy. And unfortunately, and the same thing happens in elections, it steers us wrong. And when we make wrong decisions like this, we can have cascading impacts that affect our generations. And so it's, it's critical for us right now, the things we can do right is on the opposite side. It's take a moment, breathe, not panic, don't go out and buy more toilet paper, but trust what the experts are saying. Rely on what they're saying. One, one of the things I, I, I try to tell a lot of my, my partners is when we're, when we're complaining about headquarters and there's some of their decisions, they didn't make that decision because they want us to fail. So when, we, when I sit down and I talk to a lot of our critical infrastructure partners and they're complaining about some of the restrictions and stuff, these, place, these aren't put in place because they want the economy to fail. Dr. Wilson and Dr. Lake and all their counterparts aren't making data analysis because they want the country to, to, to fall apart. So we have to think about that, that, that these decisions and this information is coming out for a reason and we have to rely on it and, and, and just go with the kind of flow rather than, rather than relying on social media. The social media is just, it's just that. It's just a bunch of people talking. Um, you have to go to cdc.gov. You've got to go to CISA.gov. You've got to go to FEMA's Uber page. You've got to rely on the experts to do their job. And that's my 50-second uh, spiel. Thank you very much. Chris? Well, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, much closer to normal by December than we are now. Um, I do think we'll, we'll still have some of the uh, supply chain issues that will need to be worked out. And I think that travel may still be a little slowed, slowed down. Uh, and, and part of that will not necessarily be because the country isn't ready, but it'll be people's mindsets. Are they individually ready to go? on another cruise ship or take a vacation or, or do those kind of things. So I think we're, we, it, it's a multifaceted uh, approach. It's not just a matter of opening things up. It's about people voting with their two feet and whether they're gonna go to that restaurant or they're gonna go to that casino or they're gonna go. So it may be, uh, we still may sl see uh, the economy a little you know, slower to start um, at, because people are going to have that uh, that comfort level that they also have to to uh, come to grips with on a, a family level or a personal level um, e even if the the you know the political folks have opened everything up um, and again we'll uh, we'll be monitoring all of that and and watching for any trends or spikes uh, in hospitalizations um, and we'll be able to you know, we'll have the benefit of the knowledge from what what we started with, which was you know pretty much zero to a hundred in in one point two seconds. 
So now we have that experience and we, we can, we can throttle things back or, or open them up a little bit based on, on real numbers and real data, which is going to be a significant benefit for everybody moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, Jim, I will give you the last word. Yeah, I think, I think the problem that we have listening to the different sort of buckets of disciplines here, uh, you know, in, in, in the country is from a public health perspective, it's save everyone's life no matter what, which is a laudable, wonderful perspective, right? And I believe in that as a physician as well. I think the reality though, and the harder conversation is our economy simply cannot sit around doing nothing indefinitely. And the current, some of the current plans are calling for us to sit around and stay isolated like this and not at work uh, for months or maybe even years while we wait on a vaccine to magically show up. And look, the reality is, I don't think our public is gonna tolerate that. We're already seeing plenty of indicators of unrest and, and protests. And they, the interesting thing is, is during Spanish flu in 1918, the city of Philadelphia had 10 times the fatalities that New York City is seeing right now when adjusted for population. This is, this is the key point here. And yet in two weeks after they started social distancing, that's where even physicians got into the media and said, this is ridiculous. This panic has got to stop. We have to relax social distancing. I got to go to work, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, I think the lessons even from history are that you better pay attention to your public and you better pay attention to folks' ability to put food on the table because at the end of the day, all the epidemiological modeling, all the public health expertise in the world, you're not gonna be able to overcome an angry public if this, if this gets bad enough economically. So we, we, we just, we have to take a balanced approach. It is what it is. I agree with Chris and, and Mike you know, fully. I think that, that come Christmas next year, this is not going to seem like such an oh my gosh moment. We'll be used to it by then. And we will have a system. And that's, the, that's really the, the take home positive message here is now we've got a system for monitoring and adjusting social distancing protocols based on what the data is telling us. I mean, we're in a wonderful position to manage this going forward, even with all the uncertainties. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mike, for being with us. Um, thank you for the fleeting glimpse of Caleb. We're sorry he got called to a meeting with the governor. And thank you to all our attendees um, for participating in this. So, you know, um, this uh, talk has been recorded. We'll be posting it, the session on our um, NSF website. And um, next month, May, we're returning to some other national security topics and uh, John McNellis will be talking to us about space wars. So uh, we'll get off this planet a little bit and look at some other threats um, that are still national security issues. So stay tuned for that announcement. I thank you very much. Um, some of the questions that didn't get answered or may have gotten answered um, only partially, we'll do our best to get those answers out to everybody as well. So thank you for participating and um, I appreciate everybody being flexible to move National Security Forum online and virtual for the few months while we need to do that. Wonderful, have a great day and please stay safe everybody.